Welcome to the Building Men Podcast. My name is Dennis Moral. The Building Men is geared toward helping you become the strongest version of yourself mentally, spiritually, emotionally, and physically. So on this interview journey that I'm on right now, um, I recently met a unbelievable human being, um, started his journey in Ohio. He's now in, in California making his way, I believe, to Texas. Um, really, really interesting story. And the way we connected was uh, via his Instagram, which is Fit Fathers and Men, which, as you can tell, is right up my alley based on the Building Men program. So I wanted to introduce uh, the audience to Ben Clark. Ben, thanks for being on the Building Men podcast, my man. Awesome. Thank you, Dennis. I really appreciate that. Yeah, my pleasure. It's um, it's uh, it's really great that we were able to connect, and I appreciate you. You you started tagging me in a couple of the posts that you put out on Instagram, and a lot of the things that you put out just got me thinking around the terms of, you know, fathers and and sons and our role as a as a masculine role model in our in our you know our sons' lives especially. So, before we get to that point, I just wanted you to give the audience a little bit of a background on kind of how where you started and then how you kind of developed this this idea this program um, with fit fathers and men. Yeah, so I grew up in a little bit of a farm town in just north of Columbus, Ohio, and. Uh, Grew up there my whole life, graduated high school, started going to the Ohio State University, and then kind of came to the conclusion of, you know what, I started riding bicycles and got pretty good and wanted to turn pro, and I didn't really have the opportunities to ride in the wintertime because obviously it snows, and so trying to ride a bike in the snow is a little bit tough, um, especially when you live out in the country. There's no parking garages or anything like that to even do anything, so we end up going to skate parks a lot and... Uh, you know, that's great and all, but it's not very good training for racing. It's better for learning tricks and everything else. So ended up connecting with my cousin out here in California. <clears throat> and he was saying that he has, you know, a house if I wanted to come and stay through the winter time. And so in November of 2010, I moved, moved out to California, picked up, left um, by myself, just packed up my car, packed up my bikes and took off. And then uh, lo and behold, you know, working on uh, 11 years later, we're still here. So, <laughs> um, and then kind of from that journey, you know, <clears throat> going through racing through my whole amateur career, I never really had big injuries or anything like that until I decided to move up into more of the pro ranks. And then I was injured almost every single year, about every six months or so. And so it was always this battle of getting back up to the board where I wanted to be, but then everybody else was a pace ahead still. Mm -hmm. So everybody you have this kind of teeter effect of, of trying to get back to where you were and you end up doing that, but then everybody else is still a step ahead. So that was always frustrating to me. And, and, and for me, honestly, I, I didn't really like the racing aspect of it. I liked more of the training, the physical uh, out, output that you put into the gym. And so from there, from the injuries and what I kind of learned from training with some trainers, as well as having injuries and going through physical therapy is I really started going into the personal training side of things and looking at, you know, how can I help other athletes or how can I help my friends is really where it started helping my friends, helping my cousin uh, with stuff. And then from there, it really trickled into, okay, I'm going to get certified I ended up getting uh, four certifications through training, different, different sizes and variations within those certifications, as far as who I want to help, what kind of modalities I want to, I want to work in and what kind of um, areas I want to be proficient in. And then, so, from there, I started really building a business and then working in different kind of smaller gyms, but able to just build that business as well on top of building my own clientele. And then just really just exploded, went to school for um, kinesiology, got my bachelor's of science degree in kinesiology, um, and then just continued to grow and continue to move. And now that I'm a, a father and a uh, father of two now, we, uh, I moved out of the, you know, working as a personal trainer full time. I still do it on the side and work more online and remotely with clients, but I work a little bit more in the corporate world now and do that more as a side hustle and really just, you know, re really wanting to provide more information through Fit Fathers and Men to those that, you know, want it to be a little bit easier and don't want to go through all of the crazy nonsense that's out there in the world right now, especially within the fitness realm, because Right now, it's all about what's the craziest exercise I can do to get the most views and followers, right? When in reality, you're going to get results from simplicity. That's it. Yep. Right? And so obviously building this and then wrapping it around a little bit around fatherhood as well as masculinity and kind of tying it all together as, as fit fathers of men and 
here we are having a good conversation with you. Right. Absolutely. So, so much there that I want to, that I want to dig deeper into the first would be around the BMX thing. So you're, you know, BMX bike riding, it's, it's an individual sport. Were there any other, did you play team sports? Did you get the opportunity as, you know, growing up where you were involved in that kind of teamwork camaraderie kind of thing? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I did team sports my whole life, played football from uh, flag football when I was six years old through, you know, uh, sophomore year of high school. And then from there, I kind of transitioned a little bit more into the, the racing field, but I was a football, baseball wrestler growing up through school and kind of doing all that, but still obviously rode bikes my whole life and just yep. built you know, living in the country, that was one of the good good things is I could build dirt jumps in the backyard and right. uh, just kind of have fun with the neighbor boys. And we built tracks and motocross tracks and, you know, all kinds of different stuff, just things that you get to go do and go do out in the country that, um, you know, unfortunately right now I don't really get to do because uh, my <laughs> my backyard is a is an alleyway here in California. So <laughs> hopefully we could change that when we uh, – up and decide to move to Texas, hopefully in 2021. So, or I'm sorry, 2022. Right. Yeah. Plan, yeah so. so the, the difference between that, you know, the sports where you're working with a team and, and BMX, where everything is on you, you know, I, I think of some of these individual sports where there's a lot that, to be said about that. And as far as your own personal growth, where, you know, if you're an offensive lineman and you miss a block, you know, no one really knows who it was there, you know, it, but if, if you're on, if you're on, you know, a, if you're on a bike and you miss a jump or something, like it's just you. So in these individual sports, there's probably a lot of um, work that you have to do, or there's a lot of self confidence that you can build. But conversely, if things don't go your way, like you're exposed, you're out there for everyone to see. So it's either like you're you succeed or you don't based on your own individual efforts. So how is that process, or what like when you think about being a father and like raising children? what's a lesson that you might have learned from that individual um, athletic performance that you could pass on? Yeah. And so, you know, having more of an individual sport, obviously you don't have teammates that you can kind of rely on to pick up the slack, right. Is you have to put in the work. If you don't put in the work, it's going to show. And really, you know, that's the ultimate lesson that I noticed with being a father is if I'm not going to be engaged with my kids, then ultimately my wife is going to, you know, be the parent of the household and she's going to be the sole parent of the household. And I might as well, it might as well be a fatherless home, right? If I'm not going to be engaged with my kids, I'm not going to do anything with them. I'm not going to teach them. I'm not going to grow with them. Right. And I'm, I'm not going to do things with them. Then it, it might as well be a fatherless home the way that I see it. And so, you know, you have a lot of this, especially now in this, this day and age as well is that you have this technology kind of cloud, over everything, right? And so we live in this technology world and we don't necessarily live in this real world of engaging face-to-face -face with our own family, right? And it becomes really sad, you know, you go to a restaurant, you look around and everybody's on their phones. Oh, my right? Nobody's talking, everybody's on their phones, you look around, nobody's chatting, having a conversation. And, you know, ultimately, you know, you and I, we've talked about it before, as well as I've talked about it with other guys. And it's, it, it becomes the stigma of fathers not having real conversations with their sons or their daughters, right? Yeah, you can ask, how was your day at school? And then that's it, right? A lot of people will do that and move on, maybe help a little bit with their homework. And that's about it. Rather than asking, you know, hey, what do you believe in this? What is your thought process on X, Y, Z, right? What does it mean to be a boy? What are you looking for? What are you into, right? Um, and then, you know, what do you want to be when you grow up? But really go into what it takes in order to get to that level and really, you know, help them understand the real world, not what they see on their phone. Because what they see on their phone isn't the reality. They see, oh, it's going to be super easy. It's going to be, I can do X, Y, and Z. I can make a YouTube channel, make millions, and blah, 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 right? That's not always the case. That's not always the reality of where they are probably going to go in life, right? 90, I would say 99% of the time, they're not going to go in that direction. Now, obviously, technology is going to take over kind of the, you know, real world working force. Um, at some point, is it going to happen within the next generation? I don't know. That's not my ex area of expertise. But it's just funny how, you know, the era that we live in now, everybody's on their phones and everybody is looking into this virtual kind of reality. And it's so, so interesting, the, um, you know, the, the phone conversation. I've had that conversation so many times. It's, 
when you're out with your family, it's, you, it's a special time you go out to a restaurant, right? To look around and see people on their phones. I mean, now you have to do the QR code to scan it to get the menu or whatever. But beyond that, put the damn thing away. Engage in that face-to-face -face communication. One thing that we've lost so much in the last year is that lack of face-to-face of -face communication. So when there's that opportunity, you need to take full advantage of it. And I loved what you said too. It's not just the conversations that you're having with your kids. It's not just how's your day, how is school? Because the answers you get are fine and good, no problem. But what you need to do is go a little bit deeper. Like you're interested in what they're thinking, um, what they believe in, what their feelings are. And as men, I think a lot of times historically, it was like, you know, kids are better seen and not heard kind of thing. Um, Daddy needs his time alone. He's going to come home from work, sit on the couch, have a glass of whiskey, and then maybe he's ready to talk to the kids. Where that's not what it's like anymore. We have to be, we have to roll up our sleeves as men, as fathers, and be ready to kind of have those nitty gritty conversations with our kids. And you mentioned, what does it mean to be a boy? So if you're having a conversation with your son and you're talking about what it means to be a boy, if, if someone were to ask you that when you were in elementary school, what does it mean to be a boy? What would you have said to that, that question when you were younger? I, I wouldn't have had an answer for you. I, uh, you know, obviously growing up, I never really had those kind of conversations with my own father, but you know, for young men and for boys, what do they really seek? Right. And, and you start to go through this whole, process of you know what does a little boy look for and it's adventure right they're looking for some type of adventure they they love superman you know superman they love spider-man they love superheroes they have this natural born gravitational pull towards you know soldiers and war and fighting and, and all this all these things right i mean my boy is two years old and you know he i haven't even taught him this and he picks up sticks and they're little guns you know and he's all yeah. pew, pew, yep. shoot them all over the place and it's just natural for us to think that way and to move forward and so you know and for me too on top of keeping that adventure and kind of going back to your point of digging a little bit deeper is it's also our job to get involved within the school system right to not just have the wife go and do things at school and, you know, she gets involved and she does the PTA meetings and all kinds of other stuff, but we need to do that as well as men, right? Take a day off here and there from your day-to-day -day job, your work, whatever you're doing and go get involved, go sit in the classroom for a day, right? Go see what your kids are doing on a day in and day out basis. And that's something that I'm really looking forward to, especially, you know, now you really look at this stigma of, you know, the educational system is broken and this and that, and to really jump in and be more hands-on within that, you're able to see, okay, the guiding subjects and principles that you're learning in school, I need to make sure that it's also my responsibility to teach you the guiding principles we have here at home, here at home, right? And so it's our job really to help you and educate you, not just send you off to somebody else and you learn there, right? It's our job to do it in the household and in, in the home. And so that's something that, you know, I really have, my wife's a teacher and she, you know, fully agrees with me on that. And she thinks that, you know, um, it, it, it's really beneficial for everybody to be engaged rather than just send them off, ask how the day is and help them with a little bit of homework and that's it. So. And when your kids have an opportunity to see you fully invested in their learning journey and their learning experience, not just mom and not just whoever their teacher is that year. You know, I'm sure Miss Crabapple is, you know, a lovely lady, but you know, when dad takes a, you know, a day off of work to come in and, and fully experience what their, their son or daughter is going through in school, that, you know, shows them a level of emotional investment in what they care about as students as well. And just that's a that's a memory that they will have. And as a father, you would have that same memory. And, you know, while you might miss a day of work, you know, stuff that you can catch up on, you're never going to be and have an opportunity to be in a, your second graders classroom again in that same capacity. You yeah, and I mean, if you, if you think about the excitement that your kids have, I mean, I think about it when I was a kid was, um, you know, taking your kid to work day with my dad, going yeah. with my dad to work, right? That was like, Oh, it's awesome. But it wasn't just because I get to skip out on school. It's because I get to hang out with dad and see what he's doing, you know, see what he does and, and this and that. And, you know, on the flip side of that, it's the other way. Oh, dad's coming into class today. I'm so excited. Right. They'll, they'll they naturally remember that because of the excitement of it's different and mom or dad are here with me. Right. And Ben, you mentioned when I said, you know, what, what would you have said if somebody asked you what it was like to be a boy? 
what your initial thing was, was adventure. You know, it was about that, you know, kind of, you know, boys are just inherently different. They're a little bit more rambunctious, a little bit more aggressive. There's that kind of, you know, fight playing kind of thing that goes on. And there needs to be like a lot of that physical contact and things like that. And so as boys, boys kind of have that genetic coding in their DNA, most of them, um, uh, or for the most part that they, they do. Then all of a sudden, like, I just started to think, as you were mentioning that, which I really haven't thought of um, ever before, is at what point do men lose that where they have that sense of adventure and sense of, I need to go and, and push myself and, and do things physically, and I really want to be involved, and I want to take risks. And Because as young men, we have that. At what point does that happen? Like, where? I don't know the answer to it. I mean, maybe it's the first time you get laid, and you're like, you know what? I'm ready for this now in my life. I don't know. But what, there's a there's a spot where it happens where all of a sudden men just become this, like, dulled down version where they're not into that adventure and that excitement anymore. Yeah, and I think a lot of it just becomes, you know, we become complacent in the things that we're comfortable with, right? We we don't look outside of the box and we don't look for uh, things that are uncomfortable, right? right? And a lot of that just comes with a little bit of maturity. You know, we look at things and we're like, okay, now that we got a little bit older, we're out of school, we're focused more on work and paying the bills and we have debt and X, Y, Z, right? So that's the sole focus. And so you become complacent in that in order to just to get by or to make more money for a new car or, you know, to, to move up within the workforce. And I think that's kind of a little bit more of the, the transition is that it really kind of stops because you're in the real world outside of just getting an education, right? You, you, you're at a college, right? Obviously you see a lot of college kids they are all over the place. They're crazy parties all the time, that kind of stuff. Right. And once that stops, once they're done, and then they have to, oh, by the way, I have to work off that debt that I had from college or, you know, whatever. Then it becomes more of a reality of, oh, now I know why things are tough, right? Now I understand this. And I think really we just become complacent in, you know, what we're doing. And so everything else that we, are, you know, seek after adventure, you know, bike riding and playing football and playing turkey bowl and all this stuff. It's like it doesn't become interesting to us because we're solely focused and we're you know, men, we're, we're kind of tunnel visioned. We only see right here with what's in front of us and what needs to be in front of us. Whereas, you know, boys and young men with that adventure seeking, they'll jump from, I'm going to be Superman today. And then tomorrow I'm going to be, you know, the, the blue angels. And I'm going to do this and that on my bike. And I'm going to do so many different things. They're all over the place. Right. And so we lose that just naturally because we get so focused on having to just provide and to protect, which is, you know, obviously two of the most important aspects that it is for men, right. Is to provide and to protect. But at the same time, we still need to hold on to a little bit of that adventure, right. Do something, whether that's working out, right. Pushing yourself in the gym, lifting 400 pounds because you've never done it before doing something like that, going for a marathon, right. Competing in your first marathon, competing in your 5k mud run, whatever it is, right. Do something. It doesn't need to be, well, you know what? I think I'm going to go try out for the NFL, uh, the MLB and all this stuff. You, you're not trying to seek towards that type of adventure. It's, it's the weekend warrior of still trying to do something in order to better yourself physically, mentally, emotionally. It keeps your confidence up. It keeps you light on your feet because of everything else that's going on in your real world life. And when your kids, you can tell them that it's real easy to say, you need to do this. You need to step outside of your comfort zone and not kind of get complacent or fall into this kind of dad bod mushy environment when you get older. And I'm kind of like, I'm talking from experience where I was at that point a year ago, I was, I kind of let myself go into a point where I was feeling sorry because things weren't going the way I wanted them to professionally quarantine. I put on, it was, I kind of fell into this like self-loathing, you know, what was me kind of thing. And I'm looking at myself in the mirror saying, you know what, if you're telling your kids that they need to do X, Y, and Z, you need to do the same thing yourself. So showing your kids by example that you need to step outside of your comfort zone. You can't fit into this thing where I'm I'm going to you know, wake up in the morning, have my cup of coffee, go work eight hours, come home, put on Netflix, have four beers, put my hand down my pants and go to bed. You know, it's that, that they need to see us pushing ourselves and getting outside of our our comfort zone. And that's where the growth will happen. And if our kids see us doing that, it's like, we can tell them that, but if we're telling them that and they're seeing us do that, 
then it's something that will really resonate and, and sink in with them. And you mentioned that the things that you're doing on a daily basis, obviously, like if you were riding BMX and you were, you know, you're also, um, you know, working in the physical trainings, you know, in that um, space, there were probably some daily habits that you put into into play that are just that become part of who you are. So say you're, you know, you're talking to your, yourself as a 16 year old. These are, these are some daily habits that you need now, Ben, to start putting in place because they're going to serve you well when you're older. What would those daily habits be? I mean, for one, I wake up now between 3.30 and 4 a.m. every day. And so a lot of that has to do with me having an eight-month-old who wakes up pretty early. Right. But a lot of that has to do with my own discipline of showing, you know, I need to wake up early and get things done because that's where I'm most proficient in getting all of my work done early in the day. So then that way I can have the rest of the day to spend with my family and do what I want to do with them. Right. And so having a little bit of that freedom and autonomy is, is great. Um, but for me, that would be one thing is really just focusing on the, the discipline to stay with something. I mean, obviously I've, I've had this conversation with hundreds of, of people and clients, right. It's having the discipline to, you know what, don't go through the McDonald's drive through take an extra 10 minutes, go home and cook right? Going through all these different things. So discipline is definitely the number one thing. Uh, I would say second would be waking up early because for me, I'm, I'm, I'm a morning person. I'm not a night owl. My wife yes. is completely opposite of me. She's more of a night owl, <laughs> but you, you know, I would say those two things really are uh, top two in my book. And then also just being more, um, being an open communicator and making sure that you're speaking truth no matter what really the circumstance might be right trying to just really stick with that truth based and not trying to beat around the bush on any type of circumstance or whatever the case may be and so you know <clears throat> really for me with this fit fathers and men thing kind of go back to your to your point that you had mentioned with getting this dad bod and you know all these different things is i i see this kind of waterfall trickle down effect right in that we try to push our kids into sports. We push them in a certain direction for what they're doing, but we don't do it for ourselves. And we just tell them what to do and we're not putting any type of action behind it, as you mentioned, right? Now, what do you think that does for the household as a whole, right? You start to get fat, you get lazy, X, Y, Z starts to happen. You know, you and your wife start to fall out of your relationship and, and all these different things. And your kids, aren't necessarily going to remember anything spectacular about you, right? However, if you get up and you are engaged with them and you're showing action as well as showing them and teaching them and guiding them through different things. I mean, if you jump on my page, you see it all the time. My little boy, he's with me every single time I work out. I turned around the other day, I was doing a hundred burpees for time. And I turned around and he was doing burpees with me behind me. And it's, it's one of those things where they catch on. It's actionable. They like to engage with you. And it really ultimately for me, one of the things that I really noticed of working out with, with my boy was that I got super, super patient because it's like you get hot, you get heated, your testosterone's going through the roof, right? And then you got a two-year-old that wants to climb on you when you're in the middle of doing right. something, right? And it's, so it's like sometimes your, your steam is coming out of your ears, but you, you learn to become super patient and take a step back and, okay, take a breath. It takes literally two seconds. Hey, play with this, just move over here, do all this kind of stuff, right? Um, and, and so those are the things that I think he's going to remember at a very young age with spending time with me compared to if I'm on the phone all the time, right? Or if he just letting him do his own thing all the time. He's never really going to remember anything about me right. or what my guiding principles are trying to teach him because I'm just telling him or yelling at him all the time for those, right? And so that's what I try to instill with showing that action and, you know, going back to what we talk about with discipline, hard work, right. Telling the truth, um, getting up early, all those things he's going to be able to see because I'm already awake in the morning when he gets up and, you know, all kinds of different stuff is that's, those are the guiding principles for me that I always see that are going to be super important for him and what he's going to remember. And there's not a, there's not a great story that starts with, I was, sitting on the couch watching Netflix. You know, that's not gonna be something that you're around a campfire telling your grandkids about one day. So what you're doing is you're providing an experiential component to life in that way. There's a book called The Last Lecture by Randy Pausch, and if you've never read it before to anyone who's listening, I would highly recommend it. 
and basically he goes through and he gives this this lecture he's dying of pancreatic cancer and throughout the the course of it he's talking about these life lessons and ultimately the the end of the lecture was basically like a love letter to his kids about life and he tells them all of these life experiences and ben what you're doing right now is your your this page that you have you're basically creating this journal this memoir this like you know future love letter to your son saying like this is i did this for you and you know i want you to experience everything that i went through as a dad and i'm sure as a father like ideas that you had about how you want to raise your son will it'll ebb and flow it'll, you'll go through roller coasters of emotions over the next how many years of your life but to to find a way to create this memoir for your son is like such a gift that you're giving to him. I mean, I just want to credit you for that. It's really an amazing thing that you're doing. I, you might, you might think it's for, for you initially or for other people. This is, this is something for your kids. Yeah, absolutely. That's great. Thank you for that. I, I really appreciate it. I think it's something that, you know, men, more men need to see, you know, more men talking about these subjects, right? Talking about what it means to be a father, what it means to be a man, what masculine is, what, you know, being masculine is, what masculinity is, and talking about it as men, not talking about it in the ways of trying to emasculate it and, you know, go in that sort of different direction, right? Or, um, you know, always talking about going and getting beers with the other guys and the boys and, you know, you leave your family at home, that's it. Whereas we really need to start having these conversations and talking with each other about it and having the information readily available. And that's something where, you know, I've just been putting it out there, have an idea about something and just run with it a little bit, you know, survival yeah. guides and, and different things of, you know, tips and tricks to be a better dad. And, and, you know, as you mentioned, obviously it is going to change over the years. And obviously now I have a baby girl and it's, things are going to be different with her compared to where, how it's going to be with him. Right. I might be a little bit, more stern with him and a little bit more, you know, hard headed with him compared to how I'm going to be with her. So, it, you know, things are going to change and in, in how you, you know, really teach and how you really parent those, those principles, those, you know, teaching foundations are always going to be there. I call it the four pillars. Um, but you know, that those foundations are always going to be there for each one, but it's going to change. It's going to move around depending on, you know, the kind of attitude and the, the energy and, you know, the personality that your kids have too, I think really, really changes that. So what are the four pillars as, as you describe them on your uh, Instagram page? Yeah. And so, you know, first pillar is going to be uh, physical, right? Putting a roof over their head, right? Making sure that they're uh, readily available to, to have anything that they need and just making sure that it's readily available there. Um, and then on top of that, you have, I, 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 some people call it spirituality, whereas if you're religious, it's kind of goes more into giving them the guiding principles within, uh, you know, any type of religious areas, but I kind of move it a little bit into morality as a second principle for that. Um, and so it just gives them more of a, a guide and a trail to follow. So that way they're just, they're not growing up being assholes. Right. Yeah, right. Right. <laughs> and so it just gives them, you know, kind of that love and that mercy and that compassion um, through that, that they end up seeing through you, right? It's a guide through you. Um, and then the second one, or I should say the third one would be mental, you know, kind of reading and learning and, and showing real life, right? Experiences, what you're going to be teaching them throughout would be number three. And then uh, the last one would be social, right? How to talk, how to communicate, how to present, right? That's something I don't, I, I think men have a really hard time with is presenting and getting up on stage and being a good communicator because that's something that we're not really taught to do. You have, you get forced to do it a little bit in school, but it's not something that you really get taught to do or you get comfortable with until you're really, you know, in my opinion, more of an adult to where it's like, okay, well, I got to suck it up and pull up my big boy pants and have at it. Yeah. <laughs> you know, right. Whereas if you teach them at a young age, how to do that, they're going to be better off in the, in the long end. Because in my opinion, 90% of all careers, you need to know how to public speak. Right. And all real careers, not jobs, careers, you need to learn how to public speak and how to talk efficiently through to other people and other businesses and other entrepreneurs. And like IQ is important. It's, it's important to have a, you know, a solid cognitive background when you're going into whatever profession. But in my opinion, more of a true indicator of potential success is your social emotional intelligence. How do you show up in a situation where you have to kind of read a room? How do you interact with people? You know, 
obviously in any kind of a business situation, there's going to be some influence that has to happen. So it'll be, how do you go about communicating your vision and your mission to people in a way where they, they can truly see your passion and they can kind of get behind you. If you don't have that, you could be the smartest person in the world, but if you can't interact in that social way and get people on board and, and kind of see what you see, you're not going to be successful in that capacity. No, not at all. Not at all. So as we're going to wrap things up here on the um, on the podcast, um, I'm just always curious about, um, you know, how you see your legacy. I, I'm such I'm, I'm so interested in, you know, people, they get to the, you know, towards the, the twilight of their of their years. Right. And, and they look back on their life and they're like, you know, you hear, I wish I spent more time with my family. I, w- I wish I took bigger risks in life or I wish I did something to leave a legacy. You've already started on that path of, of leaving a legacy. So if you were, you know, if you're, you know, you're looking back on your life when you're 110 years old after a, you know, a long, healthy, prosperous life, what would you say, how would you measure your success? What legacy would you leave, Ben, to, uh, to the future generations? Yeah, and so, you know, that's, a, that's always an interesting question because people always have kind of this, you know, punchline answer for you. And I, I don't really have one. Um, it's more of a, I want to leave a legacy behind to where my kids have a good dying relationship with me to the point to when I pass, they truly feel it, right? They remember the things that I did with them as youngsters through when they were teenagers through to what I taught them when they were adults. And it's something that, you know, for me, that's just, that's kind of my life's work and my ultimate goal for what I want, because you always hear, you know, people talk about when they're on their deathbed, what, what do you, you know, what do you regret or what do you think about? And it's always the things that they didn't do. Yeah. And so naturally every single day I strive to hit that mark of doing something new or doing something to help progress my kids or progress my family and to move in a better direction. And so that's something that, you know, I always hope to just be, you know, the guy that everybody thinks about, that's the, the true family man and, and really helps build the, not only the family as a whole, but build and have that trickle into the community and society as a whole. That's awesome. So Ben, tell us how we can get in touch with you. If somebody wants to follow along with, with what you're doing on your journey. Yeah, as of right now, all I have is the Instagram page, Fit Fathers and Men. I do have a, a, a Twitter. I believe it's called Fathers and Men. Um, so just go ahead, jump on there, Instagram and Twitter, and uh, follow along, engage, comment, share, whatever. Um, more than happy to have you. If you dislike anything, go ahead, go for yeah. it. Uh, if you don't agree, go for it. But um, just want to continue to just spread the word, spread the love, and just continue to get that information out to everybody. Thank you. Truly appreciate it. And I, I started following along with what you're doing. I truly believe in everything you're doing. I think it's so needed in society today. And I think what you're doing is going to really impact future generations. Um, so I'll put in the show notes for this podcast, ways that you can get in touch with Ben and Fit Fathers and Men. Uh, to reach out to Building Men on Instagram is building.men. Facebook is Building Men Podcast. My email address is buildingmencoach at gmail.com. Ben Clark, thank you so much, brother. It was so great to talk to you today. Um, I'll ho- hopefully have you back on when your son's like, you know, 10, 11, 12, let me know how he is along on that journey. And, um, thanks again for coming and we'll see you next time on building men. Thanks guys.